Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk dealing with change in event source applications uh, here at DevOx. Hope you're enjoying your day so far. Um, my name is Michiel, um, and I'm a freelance developer and coach from this beautiful city in the Netherlands called Utrecht. Um, if you have, uh, have never been there, I suggest you visit it. It's far better than Amsterdam, which is the... <laughs> And I'm not joking, you should just Google it. People outside of the Netherlands are also saying that this is better than Amsterdam. Just come and visit, especially in summer, it's awesome. Anyway, let's talk about change. Change is pretty much, as I wrote in the abstract of this talk, it's pretty much the only constant factor we have in software development. Um, we develop applications based on requirements, and those requirements change as we gain insight in our uh, domain, the domain that we are working in, and we improve that insight in the domain. Uh, we see different opportunities, we see changes in the market, we develop based on customer feedback, uh, which leads us into a, a direction that we did not anticipate before, uh, multiple other factors. Um, and this is something that I want to talk to you about today, uh, combined with event sourcing. Because uh, when we talk about event sourcing, uh, when I look at event sourcing in the industry, um, there's a lot of kumbaya, and there's a lot of utopia blogs, and there's a lot of event sourcing, CQRS, uh, the fixes to all your problems, bar none, um, the best things since sliced bread, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's not a lot of... Um, real-world uh, um, literature out there right now. There is, uh, that's slowly improving, um, but I want to add to that discussion a little bit based on my experience. That's also the disclaimer. These are my experiences, and these are some of the things that I found useful or not so useful, uh, and they may be completely um, um, illogical or, or useless in your context. So uh, there you go. Your mileage may vary. Anyway, change. The Agile Manifesto says we welcome changing requirements even late in development. This is one of the key principles, key 12 principles in the Agile Manifesto. Um, and change, as I, as I talked about, um, eventually leads to a modification of an application that we are working on. Whether it be a service or a monolith, doesn't really matter. That application is going to be modified or have to be modified to deal with inputs, to deal with change. Uh, and when we deal, uh, when we are talking about event sourcing, uh, well, event sourcing has a number of items in there that makes life a little bit more challenging when we do a lot of modifications. And so we're going to get into uh, two or three topics today um, that I think are very important in that scenario. But before we get going, um, I would like to talk about you first. And so please raise your hand if you have any experience with CQRS event sourcing theory, have read it. Okay, that's over half of the audience. And has anybody followed a tutorial or built a hobby project around event sourcing? All right. And who has used it or is currently using it in production? Okay, I'd say about 10 to 15% of the audience. Awesome. Um, I may insert some code examples here and there, um, and they will be mostly based on the open source framework Axon. Uh, I believe there was a workshop around Axon uh, earlier this week here at DevOx. Um, I'm in no way affiliated with the people behind the Axon framework, but the framework itself is open source. Um, and it's uh, one of the more popular frameworks in the CQRS event sourcing domain. Uh, it's a Java or JVM framework. Okay, let's get going with a quick recap of the event sourcing th theory uh, and, and why event sourcing is useful, uh, which I think, given that the number of hands I showed, is about 50%. Um, Martin Fowler stated years ago that event sourcing records all changes to application state as a sequence of events rather than the application state itself. And if we look at uh, um, a very important or very popular uh, pattern, which is called Active Record. Um, Active Record describes our uh, database or our, our, our objects from a database table or multiple database tables. And those database tables, you know, you have your MySQL, your Oracle, whatever is driving it, and it's just records in tables uh, with a certain structure 
And what these records always reflect is the current state of things, not what has led up to, the, to that state or what has transpired or specifically why it has transpired, but just current state. And then on the right side of the picture, we have uh, a transactional log, essentially. In this domain, this example domain, which is dealing with bank accounts, uh, we're not thinking in terms of the current balance of the bank account, but we're thinking in terms of all the transactions that led to that balance as it is now. So we can have accounts that are open, money that is deposited, money that is withdrawn, overdrafts, all the things you associate uh, with a bank account. And so we're going to record all those transactions that lead to the current state, rather than just the current state itself. Now, when we think about event sourcing, one thing that typically comes attached to it, or at least in the patterns combined to it, is uh, command sourcing or uh, uh, command dispatching. And commands are sim simple value classes, simple value objects um, that have nothing more than the data that you want to have, plus uh, some sort of aggregate identifier or some sort of identifier of the object we're trying to describe. Typically, commands are written in the imperative form uh, because they're a, a request to the system that something should happen, that, we're, that we want something to happen. Um, and in the case of a bank account, we can deposit money. We, have, we just need an account ID for that, and we need an amount to deposit. And then we want to turn those commands, or we want to actually validate those commands, and do that inside the domain, and then potentially turn them into events if the commands are valid. Let's assume in this case that we can always deposit regardless of conditions. And the simple thing here is that the, uh, a command is handled by a command handler, uh, which is part of our domain code, and that command handler turns the command into an event at which point the thing happened. So the command is a request for something to happen, and then once it's turned into an event, it actually happened. It is recorded as a fact, as a fact of history. And then we also uh, change the naming of the class. So now instead of the imperative form, it becomes the, the past tense, which is money deposited. So something happened. This is not something we're going to change anymore because it's happened. It's a record of history. And it's pretty much the same class as the command. So this is what the command handler does. And then we build from, a command, uh, from commands and events up until an aggregate. Uh, and the aggregate, in its most simple definition, handles commands and generates events based on its own current state and based on those commands. Aggregates react to events, um, and they build up an internal state that they maintain, which is never exposed, but it's used to guard any invariance that the, the aggregate has. That could look a little something like this. We have a class bank account with a bunch of event handlers uh, and some internal state that it maintains to uh, make sure that some commands cannot happen. For example, if I have zero in my bank account and I uh, uh, request a withdrawal of 100 euros or 100 pounds, then of course that cannot happen in uh, uh, the simple sense anyway. So we want to uh, check that, so we need an internal state for that, to, to check that. And when I said aggregates react to events, well, let's look at how that works. Um, let's take uh, three different events, three types of events. We have an account opened, a money deposited, and money withdrawn. And the aggregate reacts to those events as they occur, in that order, uh, and you see on the right-hand side the current state after that transaction was, is processed. So the account is opened, we have a new account with an account number and a balance of initially, initially zero. Then we deposit some money, 100 euros, into the account, and now our balance is 100, and then we withdraw 50, and our new balance is 50. So this is what the aggregate internal state would look like. And again, this is not exposed to the outside. Now, the aggregate can uh, validate commands, and that could look something like this. Uh, within Axon, uh, if you throw an exception from a command handler, that exception gets uh, thrown back to the original caller. Um, and this is uh, a, a validation mechanism. Uh, my 
the command that you put to, to me is not valid within the domain. So I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to execute that. So that actually does not lead to any changes in the state. It doesn't lead to anything. It's as if it never happened. It's a command that is invalid. Now, if we combine event sourcing with unit testing, we get a very powerful combination um, because we can write um, our tests in terms of domain logic, in terms of business rules, in terms of a natural language almost. Uh, Axon provides something called the aggregate test fixture, uh, which basically fakes an event sourcing implementation. And I can register my, uh, my aggregate with that fixture. And then I can write my tests in the given when then uh, variant, the given when then setup, where I say, OK, put my world in a certain state. Uh, I, there have been a bunch of events uh, had occurred before. And when I then um, request or dispatch a command, then I expect something to happen or not to happen. In this case, we're ex expecting the exception that we're throwing here. So what we do here is basically we open an account which has a balance of zero. This is the business rule that we, that we set. And then we immediately withdraw 20. Well, this, is, of course, is not something that we allow. And then we uh, throw that overdraft exception. So that's uh, very nice. Um, testing or way of testing. Not a lot of code needed to write those domain level tests. Okay, that's it for the quick recap. Let's get on to one of the bigger challenges inside uh, or when, when applying event sourcing in CQRS, it's the replaying and rebuilding of query models. Let's assume, um, and this is not really an assumption because this, ha this happens quite a lot, that we want to answer a query or uh, somebody's going to put the query to us and we need to answer that. We need to write some code to answer that query. Uh, the nice thing about event sourcing is that we have all this, especially if we're in production for a while, we have all this historical data. So we can base that query on existing events, on all the transactions that we have recorded so far. So we, we can basically dive into all the knowledge, all the history that we've built up so far. And let's take a look at a few examples. Let's say I have two types of events, account opened and account closed. And somebody comes to me and says, OK, Michiel, I want to know the number of active accounts right now. Well, this is quite simple. I can simply go through my event log, count the number of account opened events, and count the number of account closed events, subtract the two, and then I have the number of active accounts, assuming that there is no overlap and et cetera, et cetera. But if my domain is sim as simple as that, that would be a simple query. But let's say I add a bunch of other events, money deposited, money withdrawn, interest received, and the query now becomes, can you list all the accounts that have a balance over 100 euros? This is something that's going to be difficult to query directly from the transaction log. Um, if it can be done, it most certainly is going to be slow if you have a lot of transactions in your log. So we want to look at something uh, at a different way of doing that. Well, one thing you could do is project data into something else. And what that means is basically we're going to react to the events as they come in, account opened and account closed. And we're going to, in the case of the active accounts, we're going to maintain a counter and plus one it for an uh, account that is opened and minus one it for an account that is closed. And then we have a counter that uh, correctly um, reflects the number of active accounts at any point in time. And if we generalize that, we can say that we pipe one or more events through an event handler or multiple event handlers, and those event handlers in turn modify some storage. And this is where CQRS comes in. CQRS says, uh, basically, we start with a UI layer all the way at the top of the picture. And the UI layer sends the domain requests in the form of commands, which we saw earlier. Those commands are validated by an aggregate. And if successful, if valid, those commands are then turned into a, uh, one or more events, which are persisted somewhere in some sort of event store. And it doesn't really matter what or where. And then those events make it onto an event bus and are distributed over any uh, other event handler that is interested in that event. And this is completely akin to uh, simple event-driven 
uh, event-driven programming where uh, uh, some event happens somewhere, a, a mouse click, for example, and multiple uh, consumers or interested listeners on somewhere else in the system receive that mouse click, except for the fact that this event has been persisted now as well. And those event handlers can then can do something with that event and write to one or more databases or other technologies, can send emails or uh, influence external systems, what have you. But let's go with the databases. And those databases can then be queried through a data layer. And this, in turn, or this, this whole picture is CQRS, which stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. So what that means is that we're going to separate the right side, where events are persisted to disk, from the reading side, the query side. And the nice thing about this is that the query side needs a specific data model to be as efficient and as fast as possible. But that data model is not necessarily the data model that you have on the writing side. So we're actually going to split the two. Uh, this is a pattern that also works without event sourcing, but with multiple databases. Uh, we're going to stick to event sourcing in this case. Um, but you can have a completely different data model on the query side, even a completely different database engine. You could have MySQL here or Postgres and Elasticsearch there, for example. And what we can even do is deal with multiple aggregates. Let's take the example of a classified site, you know, Craigslist or, or something like that, maybe even eBay. Uh, we have a, a seller and we may have a listing, depending on... Uh, what the domain names for those terms are. Uh, a seller has a bunch of events, or there are multiple seller events for that, that aggregate, and there are multiple listing events. And we want to com come up with some sort of flat mapped collection where we have the seller name uh, that is associated with every listing that we know. So in the traditional database sense, we would have two tables and we would join them right, in a query. And the nice thing here is that we're going to actually flat map that completely uh, towards the query that we want to show. And that is actually listing that seller name along with the date and the description of the listing. And we're going to react those to those events. And in code that could look something like this, we uh, have multiple event handlers in some sort of projections class that actually react to events that we, uh, that we uh, defined. And that class registers to the event bus. And whenever account open occurs, the event bus sees, OK, this class is interested in that event. And I'm going to put it, or I'm going to invoke that method. And in this case, we're going to uh, maintain a hash map of active accounts, which is simply if we have an account opened, we put it to the, account, uh, to the active accounts map. And if it's closed, we remove it again. Uh, we assume that this can never uh, duplicate and that this always works. And then we have uh, the account number for an account ID getter, for example, to get the account number associated with a specific account ID. This is something that uh, a projection class does or use, uh, that we use a projection class for. And from the controller, we can simply wire it in like that. Now, I was talking about change. And let's assume that we got this query from, from somebody and we want to build a new projection, a new projection class or a new projection model. Uh, or we have an existing projection and we want to change its structure. And again, we want to base that on existing events that we have in our history, that we have in our event store. Now, the naive way of rebuilding such a projection would be to stop our application loop over all the events that we have in the event store, apply them to our new or changed projection, and then once that's done, we start the application and we do any cleanup that we need to do. Now, this is naive in the sense that this causes downtime, and depending on how many events you have here or how uh, uh, intense of a calculation you're doing in the projection class, this may take from a short while to a long while. Uh, in some of the projects I've had, we've had projection rebuilds that lasted for hours and sometimes close to a day even. So uh, stopping the application and running the rebuild was not an option in that case. Let's take a look at how we can potentially do a zero downtime version of that. 
We still loop over the existing events as we know them when we start the rebuilding, right? So we start the rebuild and then we have X events in the event store. We loop over them, we apply them to the new projection. But then what? During the uh, uh, projection or during the rebuild, uh, the application is still up, still online, uh, accepting requests, and there is a very good chance that new events come in while we are doing the rebuild. New events that this projection class is going to be interested in. So we're going to pick those up while we are rebuilding and put them in a queue. Uh, and this can uh, be anything, really. Uh, it can be a rabbit, can be Kafka, it can be something else. Uh, in terms of action, it's something internal. And then we apply any of the queued events after we've done the loop over the existing events. And we do that in the correct order. And then we switch to that new projection. We can even use a feature toggle to switch to the new projection, or we can redeploy our application to switch to the new projection once it's done. This allows us to rebuild our projection without incurring any downtime. Now, generally, we could say, while we are not done with the projection rebuild, uh, framework give us the next event. Then we apply that to the new projection or the new projection structure. And then we check, is it the last event or not? And if not, get the next event until we are done. Until we are done could take quite a long time, as I said, uh, depending on what you do and the technology you are uh, persisting to. Uh, we did a, uh, a whole lot of writes to Elasticsearch, which can be uh, slow on index speed. And we had a, a, a rebuild of uh, six hours. Well, the, the worst time was almost 24 hours, which we optimized at some point. Um, and one of the tricks we did was one of the projections fit in memory. So instead of every uh, event as you rebuild it, triggering a write to Elasticsearch, we loop the entire thing and build up uh, the, new, the new model, essentially, in memory. And once we're done with the projection, we're going to flush the whole thing to disk. So we're going to flush all the memory buffers to disk. There's, of course, one big caveat. It has to fit in memory. Uh, and if you crash, then you need to restart uh, all over again, because or other, you have to have some other persistence mechanism. But in general, uh, what, you, what you did is lost. There's another trick, uh, and that is called distributed, distributed rebuilds. And it's essentially where we divide the work over multiple machines. Let's assume we have a bunch of events in our, in our store uh, associated with some sort of aggregate that we're interested in. And we have two machines that we're going to divide the work over. So what we can do is simply split the uh, events that we have in half and assign them to one of the two instances and basically do the thing in parallel. And this does not have to be two machines even. It can be two threads on the same machine if you're uh, uh, locked in that way. Uh, but let's assume it's two machines. And we have a simple 50-50 split of the events in the store over the machines. Now, this works in the simple way or the simple uh, condition that you have all the events uh, for one aggregate, for example, or any events that are uh, um, not uh, directly interfacing with each other. Because if you do, let's go back to the example where we had two aggregates uh, projecting to a single data model. Now, if we were to divide this work on two machines, what would the order be? It's probably, there's, uh, uh, it's highly likely that the order that you make actually leads to an inconsistent result. Because if this seller event uh, or rather, if this listing event um, depends on that seller event, or rather in the projection, the events itself never uh, are dependent on each other, of course. But if the projection requires the uh, information for this seller, for that listing, and this is actually uh, handled later rather than earlier, then uh, you get an inconsistent or even broken projection. So this is something that is difficult to solve, if not impossible, in the generic sense. Um, in a lot of cases, it's fine. Uh, but if you deal with this, uh, something like this, then you, uh, you need to really uh, think about the 
the order of events and uh, their, uh, their dependence inside the projection. One thing, if you cannot deal with that, if you uh, are unable to do distributed task or in memory, for example, then a uh, background task would be another option. And the background task basically says that we have events in the store and we're going to iteratively process one event after the next. And at some point we may want to stop because we're going to uh, do a deploy, for example. We want to shut down the application for a little bit and then redeploy it. And we want to resume where we left off. And the nice thing about Axon is that it actually allows this trick. Um, it maintains a token for uh, the event handler where it is, essentially, what event it has seen. And it maintains that token or it stores that token in a store of its own. And it updates the token as the event handler passes linearly through the events. And so we can simply stop the application and it will um, remember where it was. And then we restart the application and it picks up and it continues. Now this is something Axon calls the tracking event processor, which it tracks its own progress. Um, and it stores its own progress in the tracking store. And um, what we did in a recent project is essentially Axon uh, does not enable this by default. Uh, what we did is, uh, is uh, enable an annotation which allows us to switch from a tracking processor to a regular, uh, which in spring would look a little bit like this. We have a configuration that uh, uses the uh, Axon configuration to actually scan uh, for all the classes that we have annotated with that rebuildable projection. And then we're going to register that rebuildable projection, which in turn calls Axon to register a tracking processor for that particular projection. So the nice thing about this is we, of course, there's a little bit of boilerplate that we added. Uh, maybe at some point this gets added to Axon itself. Um, but we, this allows us to turn any class that we have into um, a tracking processor and allows it to rebuild completely. Um, and in the background, as a thread, which is resumable. So in essence, it doesn't matter anymore how long your re uh, rebuild lasts, even though it does, of course, uh, but you're not as blocked by it uh, as the other options. Okay, enough about projections, and let's talk about versioning. Uh, and this uh, may be one of the interesting, most interesting parts of event sourcing, I think, at least. Because, as I stated before, with change, we're dealing with new business requirements, uh, new customer insight, new feedback, new features. And those can lead to a changing view on events. Because if we are developing now, we have a certain view on our domain, a certain view on events, what type of data they contain and how much data they contain. And that is uh, associated with the picture of the world that we have right now. But if our picture changes, then obviously our view on events changes as well. For example, certain events may turn out to be irrelevant after all. Um, certain events should have had different fields. We may have ha used the wrong name, typo. Um, our events are too coarse, or rather too fine, so we don't have enough data in the event. Now, there are a couple of uh, uh, theories around event sourcing that I'm going to go get into now. One of them says that, well, because events are persisted as facts of history, uh, this is something that can never change, right? History doesn't change. It's just our view on history that changes, but the facts themselves do not. So if they do not, then we need to support that legacy, quote unquote, uh, forever. Now, the nice thing is commands can always be renamed or changed because commands are not persisted. They are requests to the system and not, not persisted as such. However, events are considered by some to be immutable, right? There are facts of history and we cannot change that. So. Like the accountant, we correct our ledger not by uh, erasing uh, one entry, even though some accountants may try to do that, uh, but we correct any events that are incorrect with a new event that corrects 
the incorrectness, essentially. Looking at the accountant's ledger, an entry could look like this. We have an entry somewhere in August where uh, we have a, a transfer from inventory to accounts payable. And oops, we made a typo. It should have been 16,500 rather than 15,600. This is the right one. Now, we could, of course, you know, delete the record and insert the new record and fine, um, except for the fact that a lot of other systems may have seen this record. And if we just replace it with that one, no other system is going to see this record. And they're still working on the assumption that this is what the world has seen. So the ledger is corrected not by replacing it, but by adding another entry, which actually corrects that. And we may want to refer to that incorrect entry, like, okay, we made a typo on blah, 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 or record ID, whatever. Uh, and this is the entry that actually corrects that. And now the books are in order again. In, so we added an extra entry rather than deleting one or replacing one. And turning that around to events, um, of course, this can happen as well. Uh, we have a money withdrawn event, and there was a typo made, not in the name of the class or the event, but in the amount of money that we withdraw. So we may want to roll that back somehow or correct that. We have an account that was opened, but it turns out that the account number is duplicate after all. We may have simply not seen that yet. So we're going to, rather than delete the whole thing and pretend it never happened, we're actually going to apply an event um, that other systems around us are maybe interested in. Like, okay, this account has turned out to be duplicate and we now closed it. So this is one way of dealing with, with changes to, the, to events like that. D um, errors or uh, incorrectness, uh, typos. Uh, and another way is upcasting. And upcasting basically says we have an event store and in that event store, we have uh, events, as you have. And those events were at some point uh, of a version 1.0, uh, starting version. And let's say that we have an account open event where the account number was still in the old format, right? before IBAN, before the long uh, um, account numbers, bank account numbers. And we want to actually convert everything to IBAN, and we don't want to see any event that has the old, uh, old version of account numbers because we, we actually don't want to deal with all that. So what we do is, well, in, in the normal sense, you would have an event handler that listens to that version one of the account opened, and we would add another one. But with upcasting, what we do instead is, here's the uh, version two of the account opened, so we have a, an account number IBAN property rather than the account number itself. We put an upcaster in between. And the upcaster, in the case of Axon, takes uh, the serialized event and basically converts it from one version to the next, which is a little bit of custom code that we introduce, where we basically, uh, and yes, this is all uh, XML. Uh, that's what uh, Axon uses by default in, in its serializer. Uh, basically, whoop. basically, we're going to uh, remove the account number element from that event, and then add an account number IBAN, IBAN uh, element to the, uh, to the event with, uh, let's assume that we can convert those uh, account numbers. Now, this, the, the nice thing about this is that once the upcaster runs, the event handler is only going to see the new version of the event. It's never going to encounter uh, the 1.0 version of the event. So we can remove all the associated event handlers for the 1.0 version of the event, and we can assume that whatever they see is always 2.0, even though the 1.0 version is still in the event store. The live code is only going to see the 2.0 version, so we can remove at least some parts of the legacy. Now, there's another trick, and that is called the versioned event store, which is basically uh, a lot of words for we copy the event store as we have, and replace it while we are copying. So let's say we have an event store with uh, account open events in that, in there, uh, distort uh, in, in a linear fashion, and everything is still 1.0, and we want to actually get rid of that 1.0 again. So what we do is a copy and a replace. And just 
the way we do that looks a lot like the way we deal with projections. We loop over existing events, we apply the upcasting function, and this can be the very same upcasting function that we saw before. And then we do the same thing for all the uh, queued events that come in as we loop over the event store. And then we switch to using that new event store. And then we have basically a V2 collection where the only thing you will see is the 2.0 version of that event. And the 1.0 version is gone. Now, this does not uh, violate the immutability principle in the sense that the original collection is still there if you intend to keep it. The only thing we do is copy and replace. So we replace on the copy, not in the existing collection. So if you are very much interested in the existing collection for audit purposes or what have you, you can retain that. You can store that as a backup and you'll be fine. But in the runtime sense, you can use the latest version of the collection. And then you can also get rid of all the upcaster code, event handler code, command handler code that is associated with the previous version of that event. So effectively, we have gotten rid of the old version of the event even though in terms of a backup or an archive, if you will, we still have it. All right. Um, one last thing I wanted to talk to you about is the GDPR in event sourcing. And there was a talk this morning about the GDPR, about privacy by design and, and topics like that. Who is completely aware of when the GDPR is about to kick in? OK, the rest of you, two weeks. Um, the GDPR is uh, the EU's um, General Data Protection Regulation, which kicks in May 25th. Um, and yes, the, the, the UK, of course, still is bound by that, at least for the next year. Um, and potentially after that, um, because the EU law protects EU citizens. And so it also applies actually to US company or Canadian companies, for example, that deal with EU citizens. Whether they do that actively or, or passively, it doesn't really matter. As long as they deal with EU citizens, the law uh, applies to them. Um, they apply, it applies to any company that deals with data uh, associated with EU citizens. Now, in terms of event sourcing, the most interesting part of the GDPR is Article 17, the right to erasure. And the right to erasure, uh, and I've selected a part of that article, says the data subject shall have the right to obtain the erasure of personal data concerning him or her without undue delay. And there's some more stuff about the processor should then, without undue delay, remove the personal data, blah, 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 and a bunch of exceptions. Let's not go get into those exceptions because that's uh, uh, more than enough room for another talk. Um, but let's deal with the erasure of personal data. Now, personal data or personally identifiable information it's basically anything, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, disclaimer, uh, but basically anything that can be traced back to the individual. Um, and that's potentially quite a lot. Uh, I'm not sure about UK law, but uh, in the Netherlands, for example, license plates for cars are strictly personal. So a license plate uh, can be attributed back to a person uh, until they sell the car. But in that window, uh, that license plate belongs to a person. And if you are caught speeding with the license plate, the fine or the ticket immediately goes to the owner of the license plate. And they have the burden of proof to actually prove that they were not driving the car. So personal information. And there's more. Uh, IP addresses are personal information. Uh, and there's basically a whole lot of stuff that is personal information. And so when we get an Article 17 request from a user stating, I want to be erased, or I want to invoke the right to be erased, so then we have to remove that data. And we have to do that with un without undue delay, uh, meaning quite quickly, um, and uh, not throw up any uh, or not too much roadblocks uh, unless we have some other law that we need to uh, adhere to. But we need to either remove it or potentially anonymize it. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I think that's OK. But ask your legal expert. Don't trust me. Um, anonymize your data, but at least remove it. Now, let's say we invoke a request as, as a user to um, 
invoke our, well, we invoke our right to erasure. So what we can do based on that Article 17 request is, of course, uh, we want to notify third parties, right? Any third party that is connected to us, that processes data for us, needs to know that this person just invoked Article 17 with us because they need to do something as well. Um, and that customer, our customer, may not be aware that we actually use those, thir those third parties. Um, we need to remove from any query models, any read models that we have, and we need to remove those events from the event store. And so that's the question, how do we do that? Of course, we, we just took a look at, at a number of, of options. Well, um, immutable events still applies, uh, even though it's an option, directly deleting from the event store. It is an option. Um, another one is so that's modifying directly. It's the the problems with that are um, none of the downstream consumers or projections are going to see that you just changed uh, that event or that you removed that event. Now, if you manually or manually, if you then use a script or a process to actually remove that from all the projections as well, there's really no problem. But modifying directly uh, can come, uh, or can uh, you can come across some some uh, challenges there, or some pushback. But we can also use the version event store again, and instead of copying and replace, we do a copy with a filter. So we copy the event store, and then we filter out all the events that are associated with the customer that just did the Article 17 request. And then the thing is, we need to forget the original collection, the previous collection, because if we retain that in an archive. Depending on the retention time we put on there, we may actually be violating the GDPR again. Not entirely sure, but I think so. Um, so we drop the right events while copying the event store, and then we drop the old one. Another trick, and uh, this was suggested to me online a couple of months ago, is uh, storing the personal identifiable information externally, so not inside your event. So if you have a license plate in the event, we yank it out of that event, and we store it somewhere else. And that could look like this, that we actually have the account opened uh, event where we have stuff like name and, and other things that are personal data. And rather than keeping them in the event, we're going to end up with a, with a sparse event, essentially. And we have some sort of data store somewhere where we keep that personal identifiable information. And whenever that account open event is loaded, we actually invoke that external storage and merge the two. Now, you can imagine that this is potentially slow, uh, complicated, may not always work. Uh, but in terms of Article 17, it's easy. We can just yank out this entire row, uh, and it's like that personal data never actually existed. We just need to be aware that this event is still in the store, and we need our code needs to be able to handle, well, effectively anonymized events, because the event is still there. So this could work uh, from a functional point of view, but from a technical point of view, I see a lot of uh, issues, a lot of complexity, and a lot of performance problems. Another thing, and this is something that has also come up in the past months, I would say, is a crypto erasure. Crypto shedding, crypto trashing, crypto locking. There's uh, a lot of terms for the same thing, which basically says, we're going to encrypt the personal identifiable information. And if somebody gives us an Article 17 request, we're going to forget the key. And because nobody ever can decrypt that anymore, hopefully, until quantum computers arrive, potentially, uh, we're sort of safe. Um, how, how sort of safe? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, the guys at Axon have a module, which unfortunately is closed source, uh, and for buy. Um, so you have to decide for yourself if you want to do that or not. Um, and what they do there is basically annotate all the PII and encrypt that. And they also uh, interface with key management solutions, for example, so that the um, key can be rekeyed, essentially. The encryption key can be rotated uh, over time. Or potentially, the data can even be re-encrypted because it's at rest. And while encrypted data is at rest, it is if it's at rest for long enough, then it's at risk of becoming, well, decrypted by uh, other means, essentially, if the uh, encryption algorithm is cracked, even though that may not occur 
in our lifetime, of course. But that's another, another trick there. One of the uh, problems there is you need to have a fast enough key management system to get the key while you, as you are reading those events and decrypt the uh, event again. All right, um, closing this talk. Um, there's a lot of ifs, maybes, buts, and uh, uh, potential strategies which may or may not work. So this talk was not intended to be depressing. Um, just a little dose of yeah, what I what I found to be uh, what I encountered rather in uh, when I'm applying CQRS and event sourcing at scale in production. Um, I still think that the combination of the two is awesome, even though it's not the solution to everything. It's not a silver bullet. It does come with a number of challenges. Um, immutability is one of the bigger challenges, especially on a fast-moving domain. It does provide an audit, audit trail, which in case of the GDPR can be uh, a boon. Um, it can be a, a, an, an enormous bonus. Uh, it is inherently scalable. Um, and as we've seen, testing is especially with, with uh, frameworks like Axon, but there's uh, .NET frameworks that essentially do the same. Testing is uh, very easy. Now, if you want to reach out to me later today or uh, whenever, uh, that's my Twitter handle. I'll make sure that I post the slides for today on there. Uh, if you want to reach out to me through email, that's my email address. And I blog a little bit about this topic and other topics on my personal website as well. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, you mean, in, uh, so the question is, can you describe what the event store looks like? Um, well, well, yes, yes and no. Uh, I've done projects on Mongo. I've done projects on Postgres on MySQL. Um, so really, the technology doesn't really matter that much as long as you have uh, a stable insert performance because it's a linear tape, essentially. You're, you keep adding stuff. Um, and you're not querying as much uh, as you are walking uh, over the events. So um, I found all three to work well, en well enough where Mongo is a little bit more ops heavy, at least it was then. Maybe that's better now. Um, there, are other, there are people using Kafka as a backing store. Uh, I've heard of people use Cassandra as a backing store. Um, this depends highly on the domain you're in, the number of events you persist per day, per hour, per, per whatever, uh, how much data do you store in events, uh, how many events do you see per aggregate, for example, are your aggregates long-lived and do they have a lot of events or are they short-lived and do they have a, a limited number of events? Those are all things you need to... Uh, there, there's no silver bullet, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I've noticed that you almost threw away the exception when it came in. Say you've got an invalid command coming in, and you cross-checked it with the aggregate, and you just threw the exception. Are there any other patterns that you've seen where perhaps the exception does have relevance, and you can assist that in some way? Or um, Yes. Uh, so the question is, um, basically, the, the exception occurs in the command handler and is throw, thrown away. So, uh, it's logged or it's returned to the user uh, in some sort of meaningful UI, and then, then it gets lost. That, that was your question, right? Well, if the occurrence of the exception has business value, then I would uh, instead potentially apply an event rather than throwing the exception. Because the event is then, we can still uh, um, uh, ping that back to the user in the UI, pretty much in the same way. But since the exception occurring has a business value, we want it to be persisted. Um, so the question, do I use an exception or do I use uh, uh, an if something, then this event or else the other event, that depends on uh, what the, the value is of, that, of keeping that uh, in record, essentially. So uh, in terms of a bank account, I can... Um, and this is not even an assumption because it, it happened to me, for example, overdrafts uh, that are detected, that's something you rec want to record because you want to charge an overdraft fee at some point. 
So you, you don't just want to yank it to the user like, sorry, you cannot do this. No, we want to actually allow that user to do it and then charge him an overdraft fee. So in that case, you want to persist it so you can do something with it later on. Does that help? Awesome. Any other questions? I think we have half a minute. No? Okay, thank you all for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>